hyped up. If you were one of the 11,000 people that saw this video, congratulations, you weren't supposed to see that. I ruined the surprise that we've been working on over at our streaming service Nebula called Nebula First. When you see a new video from me on YouTube, that means that the video after it is already up on Nebula. But my brain must have been real smooth lately. Cause I upload the wrong video. The ad free extended cuts of these videos are up on Nebula and the best way to get access to them is through the smartest bundle in streaming, Curiosity Stream on Nebula. And with this Black Friday deal, you could get the annual subscription for 42% off. Nebula got exclusive and extended cuts from your favorite independent creators like Olivia Sun and Philosophy Too. And Curiosity Stream got thousands of documentaries like this one I've been watching that's probably the most fascinating deep dives into Africa I've ever seen. The riches of nature and culture come together in Africa. This is a continent of mysterious places, seasoned institutions, and rituals whose power has survived centuries of turbulence and change. But most importantly, you get to keep these conversations going. If it weren't for people like you subscribing to sponsors like Curiosity Stream, we would not be able to fight for the most marginalized. Because creators that are creating content that challenges the status quo wouldn't be able to sustain themselves because we are most at risk for getting demonetized. So touch up the link in the description to get the smartest bundle in streaming, Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $11.59 with this Black Friday deal. Now back to whatever you talking about. These two are ambassadors for nationalism. We don't do that here. Take it from me, take it from Breitbart. I know you're saying citing a white supremacist cesspool like Breitbart. Indeed I am. This opine obviously suffering from an acute case of bigotry. Give it to me straight, doc. Is he gonna make it? I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid he won't make it. He wants to die on this hill. And that hill is a trans woman that trans women aren't women. I'm sorry. I tried. I tried so hard. But the article does reveal an interesting, though flawed, parallel between T'Challa and Trump, bringing me to this video essay's hypothesis. Is nationalism actually good for marginalized experiences? And in an effort to inquest my hypotheses, I fled Iowa to escape skullduggery. Just to find that skullduggery here too. Only this time, it's as dark as me. So in this series, I challenge our beliefs whilst revealing our humanity. I right, go boy. Bless it, bless it. You on camera say hi, dog. Hey, what's, what's going on, fam? What's up? Bless it, bless it. But being publicly progressive in a hyper-conservative environment is extremely dangerous. I ain't even anonymous like I was in the States. This could actually get me killed. Like a squat. But I have to fight for the most marginalized. Because until the final battle is won, I am still a foreign man in a foreign land. So what a street interview about Haitians have to do with Black Panther. So you know Wakanda is a figurative country rich in vibranium. The Wakandans is cosplay as a third world country to circumscribe people. Go on, bro. Circumcise. What movie you was watching, bro? Circumscribe, boy. I forget you was a nerd too, Dread. Speak English, though. Breitbart needed a way to make Black Panther about Marga Sapiens. Because you know that a black piece of media can't exist without being political. So instead of them taking the easy route and just lambasting this film as woke propaganda, they spun this story like I've never seen anything get spun before. You should see what Nolte argued. T'Challa is big on border security, believes Wakanda and Wakandans should come first and fiercely protects his country's culture from outsider, including refugees. Like President Donald Trump, T'Challa's beliefs are not based on race. This is not a black thing. This is a culture slash survival thing. Naturally, this article fueled even more misinterpretations of Black Panther. Like this amazing piece of propaganda that we got. I could refute this rotten pole vault that these maggots use to leap to this conclusion. I could go on for days about the fundamental differences between white nationalism's defense of white supremacist hegemony versus anti-colonial nationalism's defense. Or better yet, I could even talk about the T'Challa recognizing the errors of his ancestors' ways and adopting a new philosophy for Wakanda going forward with his UN address. We will be sharing our knowledge and resources with the outside world. More connects us than separates us. We must find a way to look after one another. But your favorite talking skull has already covered that for me. 
I mean, even a broken clock strikes right twice. And I'm gonna drop a whole movie on the subject already. Oh, my oxtails. Oh no man, these burn. Oh no man. Oh gosh. These oxtails almost as black as me. So my interest is more peaked at the claim of black nationalism. Luckily, I'm from a black nation. So I took to the streets of Awaki to ask questions that reveal Bahamian nationalism. Kung salad is more than a delicacy in the bombs. It's a real Kung salad right there. It's an artifact of cultural camaraderie. But over the years, Haitian immigrants have innovated the dish out the dismay of Bahamian locals. However, that's not the only thing that changed. Even the makeup of Kung stands at Arawaki has shifted from majority Bahamians preparing these Kung salads to Haitian. So you can imagine my surprise when Vaughn and I stumbled upon the last Bahamian Kung stand on our Waki. He probably is Odo. Bless it, bro. Yeah, what's going on? Where are you from? The majority of people working Kung stands is Bizo. I mean, that's true. A lot of Bahamians being making salad. They just don't be looking. They're out of patronization before they come to us. Even the mere assumption that he could be Haitian incensed him. And you could hear the resentful Tony as due to him feeling like Bahamians don't patronize their own. And before I go any further, I'd like to approach these interviews with empathy and good faith. And I encourage you to do the same. I don't want to dunk on anybody in these interviews, not because they're Bahamian, but because I want to reveal the true nuance behind these feelings. And I want to practice giving space to anyone, anywhere on their journey away from bigotry. Because we all are. We're not at our desired destination which is unproblematic leftist takes. Because your take today could very well be a bad take tomorrow. Now, the Bahamian conk man. I sound like a superhero. He's displaying Bahamian nationalism. He resents this idea that Haitians are taking the market share of people looking for conk. And the only thing that gives him the privilege of even being mad at that is because he feels entitled to it as a Bahamian. Now, let's look at this in the context of Black Panther. The Wakandans didn't want outsiders in their country, and the Wakandan pride is palpable throughout the film. It wouldn't be far-fetched to say that these Wakandans are displaying a degree of Black nationalism. Ergo, there may be some glimpses of parallels between T'Challa and Trump. T'Challa is much more like Wakanda don't give nobody <laughs> I care about Wakanda and that's it. So he is much more of a nationalist figure and less of this like, we need to share our resources with the world. Now one of the pillars of populism working overtime to prop Trump up is his America first rhetoric. I mean, who could forget his very incendiary remarks on immigrants? They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. This is an age-old rhetorical weapon, evoking an emotional and exigent exclamation that you, the American, is at risk of losing what you have to these immigrants. Almost like the irrational fear that Bahamian conk man has that Haitians are coming to take his job and tell him how to make conk salad. Hey, could you come in my country and tell me how to make conk salad? That's what I try to do. How you could come here and tell me how to make salad? I just want them to be able to respect where they is. I love how you like, they ready to fight you, bro. Buddy, you come on board, I come on board. This emotional appeal to xenophobia is similar to the one that Tariq Ashi, I mean the Sheed. Pause, eh? Hold up. Man, listen to me. You come on sectionary cover for them EDOS and FBA people, you know. Can I talk one time? Okay, let me rephrase that. It's similar to the rhetoric that Marine Le Pen or Brother Boris uses, and we see how that goes. But is T'Challa's brand of nationalism different? Wakanda is African coded and aims, attempts to showcase African cultures. Granted, the illustrations could use some work because the film represents a bunch of different African countries at different times, and it just tries to mud them together and make an amalgamation of it. That's not the wave. We're not trying to go and reduce all kinds of different African countries and swaths of African experiences to just this one kente cloth of a film. Nonetheless, it is redolent of Africa, a continent that has been ravaged by colonialism, pillaged by slavery, and whipped by white supremacy. The true potential of Africa will forever be stymied by the effects of the imperial West. By all accounts, Africa is a marginalized continent. So is it wrong for them to protect and preserve the resources that they have left? Vibranium is a symbol of what Africa lost 
And Wakanda's Afrofuturism that's depicted in the film is a figment of what could have been. Why would it be wrong for these marginalized people to protect the culture and resources that they have, given the context? Nationalism, in my mind, comes up the way that we viewed it, like, you know, with like the Nazis and everything, is about a nation that has felt shat on and create a sense of national pride by taking the mythology of a nation and turning that into fact and using it to weaponize younger people to be ready to die or commit terrible things for a nation. And that's not what Wakanda is doing. Wakanda is proud of Wakanda because they have built like all this technology and they have created all these things to help themselves as a people. So their national pride is like, look what we have done for ourselves. Now applying this logic to a real world context, one may empathize with Bahamian Konkma. You get more, more furnace than the young one. Young people, but he's human, but basically you have to be cracked down on what's really going on because you better get the fire. He was not nothing for the younger generation. There are some valid points here, but with caveats and a big stinking asterisk. Because it's true, the Bahamas wasn't predicated on the same mores as the United States and Canada. The notion of a country built not on a homogeneous populace or a religion, but on an idea, is the United States credo. The United States and Canada is a country built for immigrants by immigrants, and that's in pursuit of their constitution. Now, that's not in the Bahamian constitution. We don't have a carrying capacity that can comfortably cater to boundless and countless immigration. So the question is, are our resources at risk of being depleted to a point where we need to be worried? And if so, who's doing the depletion? Stick a pin in that. That's what minority nationalism looks like. It's far different from the white hegemonic countries trying to justify preserving their lineage. It's impossible to say that and not sound like a certain Austrian artist that failed, by the way. Because at the risk of sounding redundant, whiteness is not real. It's a political construct weaponized to exclude and circumscribe certain people from getting resources and getting power. And those certain people are non-white people. That's why so much works in concert, behind the scenes, so subtle that it looks like nature itself. To preserve whiteness as being the default, therefore estranging and othering anything that isn't white, while simultaneously robbing white people of their actual cultures. Their Irish heritage, their Nordic dress, their Italian... No, wait. Italians think they black anyway. Lord, you're so glutton for pain over. What happened now? You can't say them things. I can't do nothing! The point is, nationalism from the oppressed is far different from that of the oppressor. But regardless of it being different, is it right? Using the Bahamas as a case study, we have a tumultuous relationship with IT. Ever since the Papa Doc era, many Haitians during that period expatriated from their home in search of a better life. Whether that be in the United States, where we've seen the traumatic response from the American government, or the Bahamas, where many Haitians call their new home. I'd be remiss not to start off with saying that not many people want to leave everything they know behind, especially in the way that these immigrants do. Many Haitians are liquidating everything they have just to risk their lives to get to their destination across these dangerous waters. And for those who actually survive the passage, because many of them don't, they're immediately captured and then deported back to Haiti in a worse position than they left in because now they have no belongings. But for those few Haitians that are able to get into society and then sublimate and turn into ghosts just to live, to get what they need, they do what they must. And many Haitians, especially in the early immigration periods, are confined to very groveling and soul-crushing labor. And speaking of which, this is a phenomena that this Bahamian actually was able to speak to, and this was his sentiments exactly. It's appalling, but we need them niggas. Them niggas to do the work with our niggas don't want to do. Government workers just hire them to work for them. Yeah. Me in the yard, man. That's, when, they didn't, when they don't want to pay them, after they didn't get a big, uh, after they work the people to get, then they call immigration on them themselves. This is a very interesting take that I hear a lot. This idea that immigration is fine because it creates a class of people that are willing to do the work that the citizens that already live there are just not. 
Even my co-host, Vaughn Trapp, made a similar assertion when I interviewed him. I don't know why Behem is complaining about Haitians coming and taking jobs and like shit like that, because they pretty much doing the shit y'all don't want to do. And I'd like to quibble with that idea. While it may be true that these people are willing to do the work that citizens aren't, is that a normative reality that you're okay with? This is a marginalized country now that we're in, the Bahamas, that has gone through colonialism, gone through slavery. And now you're saying that you're okay with a people, a class of people that look just like you, being oppressed by an oppressed class. Doesn't that sound a little bit too familiar? to something that we all already know. But let's shelve the ethical argument. Let's shelve the fact that low-key, we be slave in Haitians. What about the practical argument? What about the immigrant that has lived here for years, had children here that have no connection with the parents' homeland? At what point does that immigrant transcend their foreign status? And when they inevitably do, what if they want more? To this very day, you can find many Haitians toiling away on Bahamian landscapes or cleaning Bahamian households. And for a while, it was fine. Bahamians, marginalized in their own right but unbeknownst to them, are now able to subjugate another class of people. Not to the extent of imperial Western slavery, okay? I ain't acquainting this with the transatlantic passage. Yes, these Haitians are being remunerated for their work and they're accepting that remuneration. However, you and I already know that they working for peanuts. And many would say that the true value for an illegal immigrant working for a Bahamian is that that Bahamian will then try to get that status lifted for the illegal immigrant, and then they will be a citizen. But something changed in this dynamic, this seemingly harmonious dynamic between Haitians and Bahamians. And that is that the Haitians got numbers. They're watching TV, they're listening to the radio, they ain't got no money. Asian just grinding more. Yeah. Hey, that's grinding more. You know, wait. It seemed like the woman of yesterday. Think about it. We have, we are a granddaddy or Grammy with a 11, 12, 13 children. I don't yell at one or two babies. She does it. She done. The Haitian the most part. I read you on their their racist about it. in the last 20 years. It's hard to find a full baby. You feel right? Yeah. Check your heritage. <laughs> Somewhere down the roof, one of them niggas is the reason you yeah. <laughs> In your average Bahamian public school, Haitians outnumber Bahamians. I went to school with Haitians that had far more means than me. And even more recently, the truculent hurricane Dorian ravished a Bahamian island by the name of Abaco. And on that island, beneath the dilapidated debris, <laughs> a Haitian shanty town was revealed. This shanty town was hidden almost like Wakanda. And it had thousands of occupants and advanced technology. Running water, rigged electricity by drop cables. It was actually rather impressive to me. And let me tell you, Bahamians were furious that Haitians were living off the grid and stealing resources. What is anger but fear? Fitted with thorns. The Bahamian fears that their position in this dynamic between Bahamians and Haitians have changed. Haitians have numbers now. Ergo, they may vie for political enfranchisement. They may be more than your docile worker. But what's so interesting about the tension between Bahamians and Haitians is that not very long ago, we were in the same boat. Literally. Where Bahamians come from? Where Bahamians come from? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of Bahamian um, ancestors came from Benin in Africa. Yeah, right in Africa, West Africa. And where do you think Haitians come from, too? All of them come from the same place. It is be hurting me, you know, because we so close. Though the Haitian Revolution and the Bahamian independence struggle took place on different timelines, our struggle is shared all the same. But the fuel of that struggle, the nationalism that we celebrate every Independence Day, now turns sour towards our former kin. We see this similar shared solidarity of nationalism between Black Americans and Africans. The irony being that the pride we take in the culture forged in these separate countries are forged by our foes. White supremacy and imperialism drew arbitrary lines throughout the African continent. Colonial avarice stole Africans from their mother 
and discarded them all throughout the world, whether it be the Americas or the Caribbean, all to be grandfathered into this culture that we celebrate. But think about what we celebrating. Sure, we may be celebrating some of the achievements we made post-colonialism, but the very flags we wave were forged in artificial and violent separation from the rest of the black diaspora. But for this pie not be sliced, what could have been if history turned out just a little differently? We might all consider ourselves part of the West Indies Federation, or Grenada might have united with Tobago instead of Trinidad, or the scramble for Africa could have cut out new lines in the sun and the soil. To me, it's an example of like, well, what was Africa like before imperialism? tribal. We break it down into like, you know, Nigeria, da, da, da. but that's not how we would have broken it down if we had just been allowed to visit. We were in our tribes and whatever and whatever. And you even see that a little bit in Wakanda, like they're all Wakandans, but they have all these 12 different tribes with their own little cultures and they have to come together and all that kind of stuff. So like that is almost purely an how Africa would be. Tribal nations that interact and combine with each other. Sometimes one is body and the other, but they're not, we're not like a uniform base. That comes in response to the imperial project, the, the empire project, which then encourages you to like, let's combine with these hoes and just make one big hoe sector. You know what I'm saying? So now you have to have like a pan-African thing because now you have to be a unified fort against other people. Being back in the Bahamas has allowed me to connect with my culture and all of the things that I missed about being on this little skip of rocks in the ocean. But this isn't one thing that I missed. November is the beginning of what we call teething season in the Bahamas. With holidays right around the corner, we normally see and expect, anticipate, an uptick in crime. And from a leftist lens, we understand that crime isn't endemic to any one people, but a byproduct of violent poverty. But I wasn't looking through a leftist lens when I saw my phone ringing today. When I hear my ma voice quivering, because a gun had just been jammed in her face. Simply by virtue of me being home, I could feel my progressive sensibilities being stripped from me. With proximity to patriarchy, this hyper-conservative environment that forces me to perform man, how hard it is for me to hold on to hooks. How hard is it to preach prison abolishment to you when I'd rather punish the pistol boy that holds up a woman at gunpoint, especially when it's a woman that's so close to you. When you get that call, like second nature, your instincts creep in. And mine was one of vengeance. Mine was one of protection. It reminded me of the masculinity that he displayed and performed. And without spoiling, you remember how that ended up for him. I wondered if what I was doing was really about protecting the people that I love. Or was it about protecting my wounded masculinity? I'm reacting to my wounds in a way that I have to compensate for the fact that there's nothing that I can do in that moment. There's nothing that I can do to change things. All I can do is perform anger, rage, but it serves no utility but your own. It's the Will Smith slap. It's the Jay-Z and Ghostface Killer braggadocio. These scripts are so comforting in times of turmoil. But it takes guts to be gentle and kind. And look in the face of your foe and forgive them. And don't get it twisted now. I want blood. However, the conundrum for me is that I know that that rage in that direction is not rage well spent. Is it worth punishing the perpetrator of this crime when he's just a branch? of a gangrene root. Because the indigent and dehumanizing poverty that spawned this crime still exists. And there's far more people like him that call that spawn point home than there are oligarchs that create and benefit from it. So as good as reveling in the reins of patriarchal protection, the warm blanket that it provides, as good as that feels, I want to consider an alternative. Many politicians run on tough on crime platforms. Rarely do you witness one running on eradicating poverty that perpetuates the crime. The way Trump fuels your insecurities 
of both financial and literal security. They weaponize this concept that crime is a byproduct of sociopathic and evil others that need to be barred from being in this country. When really, crime is a desired byproduct, a predicted one. Because when there's crime, there's justifications to spend obscene amounts of money to defend it. But when last have you seen government bodies and police actually defend or protect you from crime, even reactionarily? Because we know what happened with Black Hawk Dawn. We know what happened with 9-11 when they actually had information to prevent that from even happening in the first place. No, of course not. It's far more convenient, it's far easier to place the onus, to put the burden on an illegal immigrant to claim that they are the reason for the crime. They are the reason for your woes because they have no political capital to even defend themselves from your assertions. I've heard countless times that Haitians are the cause, the authors of crimes all across Nassau and the Bahamas. Majority of the crime is from Asians. Majority of the crime is from Asians. The young Bahamian men in jail. The majority of Bahamian men in jail, but the crime is majority Haitian. Because it's more than we deal with us. It's crossbreeds too. No, there can be no Asian Bahamian. There can never be Asian Bahamian. There can never be a Haitian Bahamian? Any Asian Asia. The Socratic method never fails, you know. But seriously, just think about it. Do you really think that violence is endemic to a people? Is violence for the Haitian as normal as hypocrisy for the conservative? Do you really think by virtue of being from Haiti means that you're fundamentally different from us? Because guess what? They simply one stop on the boats. When the plantationers came to the Caribbean, they took their slaves with them. Some of them went there and some of them went here. And to add insult to irony, Hispaniola, the landmass that Haiti is actually located on, was once one of the richest regions of the world. But it was colonialism that murdered that future. Colonialism that makes me speak of Haiti in hypotheticals of what could have been. Whatever differences between Haitians and Bahamians is due to the culture that colonialism either bred or is in reaction to. So in that regard, you're right. Haitians are different. Some Haitians that made that very unfortunate trek probably are PTSD from simply getting here. So instead of vilifying them, how about opening our eyes to the true enemy? And Wakanda forever, spoilers by the way, we see something strange. You have these two brown black nations who are in conflict the entire time and the CIA right there in the background just like... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Much like the internecine enmity between Asians and black people or black people and black people, there's an invested interest in the mutual dysfunction of the marginalized. Much like there's a concerted effort to make sure that the marginalized never ensemble. And whoever benefits from this dysfunction typically is the author of it. But instead of beating up on the white people, because I ain't gonna lie, I really been going too hard on the whites lately. I'm sorry. I love you all too, you know. Let's look at it from a class lens. The oligarchs, the bourgeoisie, whatever you call a rose by any name. Not only do they benefit directly from chaos amongst race, but also amongst working class people. And Namor, in this case, was spitting. The insecurity felt by the marginalized in both class and race stems from this fear that we're gonna run out of resources. This is called manufactured scarcity. And as a political science master, I must say that we loathe economists. However, we're gonna use an economist term today. Politicians, in collusion with media, killmonger, I mean, fear monger. The extent to which resources are running out is not the same extent that sensational journalism would have you believe. And these very journalists always attach the drain of resources to a very vulnerable scapegoat. Whether it be the black welfare queen or the lazy immigrant that collects welfare checks but does nothing. This argument is always framed in this fearful context that immigration is unsustainable. Despite the fact that this immigration, legal or illegal, just depends on what color you are is literally the foundation of that nation. Outside of building on the literal box of black slaves that was stolen from their homeland to build America. The issue with immigration always arises and only arises when it's a particular immigrant. You don't even hear about the white immigrants that's coming into the United States because they're called expatriates. And this faulty argument that the resource drain argument is built upon has a very simple and obvious rebuttal. Let's say the evil Haitian immigrant is taking one loaf of bread 
to feed himself and maybe his family. Whereas the Bahamian bourgeoisie has literally a factory's worth of loaves of bread that will probably go bad before a week's out. How daft are you to attack the one boy with the one loaf of bread when this oligarch, this bougie fella right here, this Bahamian MP that's selling your country, got a whole factory's worth. That's how silly you sound. When you accuse the little immigrant that barely getting by, that you even say living in squalor, is making an impression upon your resources that is eclipsed by the rich. Let's say um, people stealing bread, like actual bread, like, yeah. not, like <laughs> actual loaves yeah. of bread. One person taking one loaf of bread to feed themselves and everything like that. And then you got another person taking 100 loaf of bread, maybe sell 25. Who are you going after? I'm going after the one who's getting taken the most. So you think Haitians taking the most or potentially politicians? I talked about how Hurricane Dorian unearthed a Haitian civilization in the Bahamas. Instead of reacting with rage, mine was of curiosity. But for we coalesce our collective minds and power, what bountiful bounds may we breach? What limits would we reveal? to be steps to an open world of possibilities. That's why with all of the gripes I had with Wakanda forever, which was many, I love this ending scene. When the Mesoamerican came to Namor in disappointment, saying, why would you bow? Why would you bend your knee to the Black Panther? And his retort was that allying with Wakanda would result in an alliance that far exceeded what they had already, revealing a picture of two unified animals symbolizing that alliance. It's international solidarity. Not only the antidote to nationalism, but the antidote for class struggle as well. And yes, it's true that both Black Panther movies were basically monarch soap operas, but that's a whole nother video probably. But my point still stands. The old man Marx say, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. The sometimes flawed and bastardized Pan-Africanism and other forms of international solidarity have been an empowering force in our history. Nationalism might be essential to a marginalized nation's initial fight against their oppressors. When you're nation building and resisting an oppressive regime, nationalism is the bugle of laughter that reassures you in your fight. It's the warm soup in the winter it's the light that dismantles the fog of uncertainty. But all things in moderation, even moderation, and especially nationalism. We must look beyond nationalism before it blinds us to our bigotry and circumscribes us the bounds of rationality of what we really could be. Before it keeps us from uniting with our fellow big non-binary folk them big woman them and big man them all around the world of all sorts of colors. We can break these chains and set forth a better tomorrow across the horizon. And to learn more about the dangers of nationalism, touch up one of these videos right there. You are now watching The Nebula Cut.